The production function we've used in this course relies on two inputs, labor and capital. We've been talking so far about labor, where labor supply and demand comes from and how wages get set. And we know where labor comes from. It comes from people working. Capital's a bit trickier. Remember that capital's all the machines, land, and other physical inputs that firms used to make stuff. While we can measure labor in terms of the number of hours of work, we can measure capital in terms of the money invested in all these physical inputs. That is, there are lots of different types of capital, but all are linked by one common thread. They represent a diversion of current consumption towards future consumption. Instead of using $1,000 to buy something to consume today, a pizzeria might use it to buy a brick oven that can make pizzas to be consumed tomorrow. The brick oven is a type of capital. The original concept of capital came from grain farmers. Each planting season, the farmer had a choice. Each grain could either be eaten or be planted to grow more next year. The grain the farmer put aside to plant the next year was his capital. He couldn't consume it this year, but it would become his consumption next year. In today's market economy, the choice between current and future consumption is usually not this direct, but the idea of capital is the same. Capital is the money firms invest in machines, land, and other factors that go into producing the goods of tomorrow. So let's say you want to start a company. As we've seen, you're going to need labor and you're going to need capital. The labor will be your time. Remember, your time isn't free. There's an opportunity cost. You could be doing something else. What is the capital you need for your company? That depends, obviously, on what your company is going to do. But let's say you need some computers and office space. Where are you going to get the money you need to buy this capital? You're going to borrow it from the capital market. The capital market is the pool of money the firms could draw on to make investments. Just as there's a labor market with workers and their hours, there's also a capital market represented by all the ways you can borrow money for your company. For example, you could take a loan from a bank. Or you could directly get loans from people by issuing bonds. Or you could sell stocks and trade some ownership of your company for money that you can invest. All of these methods of raising capital for your company share a common feature. The supply of money to you comes from individual decisions on how much to save. Just as individuals' decisions on how much to work determine the amount of labor available to firms, individuals' decisions on how much to save determines the amount of capital available to firms. Individual savings go to into a pool of capital from which firms draw to make their investments. So the market for capital for firms looks a lot like the market for labor for firms. The firms demand some amount of capital, and individuals supply that capital. In the market for labor, the quantity was the number of hours of labor, and the price was the wage. In the market for capital, the quantity is the amount of capital provided, and the price is the interest rate that has to be paid back to the lenders. That is, if I provide an hour of labor to a firm, the firm pays me a wage for that hour of my time. After an hour, I can leave with the rest of my time intact to sell to another firm. If I provide a dollar of capital to a firm, the firm pays me interest on that dollar of my money. At the end of the year, I get the dollar back plus an interest payment they give me for letting them use my dollar. This leads to the supply and demand graph for capital markets, illustrated here. On the horizontal axis is the amount of capital in dollars the quantity of capital. On the vertical axis is the interest rate, the price of capital. The capital demand comes from the same type of analysis we did for labor demand. Firms have to decide whether to borrow the next dollar. To do this, they make a profit maximizing decision, trading off the marginal benefits and marginal costs of that dollar. As usual, the demand curve is downward sloping. As the interest rate goes up, the marginal cost of borrowing a dollar goes up, so firms want to borrow less. The supply curve comes from individuals' decisions on how much to save versus how much to consume now. As usual, the supply curve is upward sloping. As an individual gets more interest for saving dollars, they're willing to save more now and forgo using these dollars to buy stuff to consume now. And just like always, the equilibrium will be the point where the two curves cross. At this interest rate, firms are demanding the same amount of capital that individuals are willing to supply, and everyone is happy.